Welcome to today's session. Philosophy of Education, Scope and Value. The scope of philosophy of education is confined to the field of education. Thus, it is philosophy in the field of education. The scope of philosophy of education is concerned with the problems of education and these problems mainly include interpretation of human nature, the world and the universe and their relation with man, interpretation of aims and ideals of education, the relationship of various components of the system of education, relationship of education and various areas of national life like economic system, political order, social progress, cultural reconstructions, etc., educational values and theory of knowledge and its relationship to education. These problems constitute the scope of philosophy of education and explain its nature. Thus, the scope of philosophy of education includes the following. First one, aims and ideals of educational philosophy. Education critically evaluates the different aims and ideals of education. These aims and ideals have been propagated by various philosophers in different times. They are character building, man making, harmonious human development, preparation for adult life, development of citizenship, utilization of leisure, training for civic life, training for international living, achieving social and national integration, scientific and technological development, education for all, equalizing educational opportunities, strengthening democratic political order and human source development. These and other aims of education presented by educational thinkers in different times and climes are scrutinized and evaluated. Thus, philosophy of education critically evaluates different aims and ideals of education. Interpretation of human nature A philosophical picture of human nature is a result of the synthesis of the facts borrowed from all the human sciences with the values discussed in different normative sciences. The philosophical picture, therefore, is more broad as compared to the picture of man drawn by biology, sociology, psychology, economics and anthropology and other human sciences. Next, educational values. Value is typically a philosophical subject since it is more abstract, integral and universal. Philosophy of education not only critically evaluates the value but also systematizes them in a hierarchy. Educational values are determined by philosophical values. Educational values propagated by different philosophers have been derived from their own worldview and their outlook on the purpose of human life. Therefore, a scrutiny of the worldviews Outlook and beliefs are the specific functions of philosophy and it is necessary for the philosophical treatment of the values. Theory of Knowledge Education is related to knowledge. It is determined by the source, limits, criteria and means of knowledge. The discussion of all these falls within the jurisdiction of epistemology, one of the branches of philosophy, therefore an important area of the functioning of philosophy of education is related to theory of knowledge. Relationship of education and various areas of national life. One of the most important contributions of the philosophy of education to the cause of education is the provision of criteria for deciding the relationship of state and education, economic system and education, curriculum, 
school organization and management, discipline, etc. These problems have led to the evaluation of different philosophies of education. The criteria of judgment everywhere are determined by philosophy. Therefore, philosophy of education provides the criteria for critical evaluation and judgment in these fields. Let us move on to study the value of philosophy of education. Philosophy of education is one of the areas of applied philosophy. There are three branches of philosophy, namely metaphysics, epistemology and axiology. Metaphysics is a branch of philosophy that investigates principles of reality transcending those of any particular science. It is concerned with explaining the fundamental nature of being and the world. Metaphysics is the study of the nature of things. Metaphysicians ask what kinds of things exist and what they are like. They reason about such things as whether or not people have free will, in what sense abstract objects can be said to exist and how it is that brains are able to generate minds. Axiology is the branch of philosophical inquiry that explores first one aesthetics that is the study of basic philosophical questions about art and beauty. Sometimes philosophy of art is used to describe only questions about art with aesthetics the more general term. Likewise, aesthetics sometimes applied even more broadly than to philosophy of beauty, to the sublime, to humor, to the frightening, to any of the responses we might expect work of art or entertainment to elicit. Second, ethics, that is the study of what makes actions right or wrong, and of how theories of right action can be applied to special moral problems. Subdisciplines include meta-ethics, value theory, theory of conduct and applied ethics. Next, epistemology. It is the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. It attempts to answer the basic question what distinguishes true that is adequate knowledge from false that is inadequate knowledge. Practically this question translates into issues of scientific methodology. How can one develop theories or models that are better than competing theories? It also forms one of the pillars of the new sciences of cognition which developed from the information processing approach to psychology and from artificial intelligence as an attempt to develop computer programs that mimic a human's capacity to use knowledge in an intelligent way. When we look at the history of epistemology, we can discern a clear trend in spite of the confusion of many seemingly contradictory positions. The first theories of knowledge stressed its absolute permanent character whereas the later theories put the emphasis on its relativity or situation dependence, its continuous development or evolution and its active interference with the world and its subjects and objects. The whole trend moves from a static passive view of knowledge towards a more and more adaptive and active one. The different branches of philosophy overlap one another. A philosopher considering whether people ought to give excess wealth to the poor is asking an ethical question. However, his investigations might lead him to wonder whether or not standards of right and wrong are built 
into the fabric of the universe which is a metaphysical question. If he claims that people are justified in taking a particular stance on that question, he is making at least a tacit epistemological claim. At every step in his reasoning, he will want to employ logic to minimize the chance of being led into error by the great complexity and obscurity of the questions. He may very well look to some of the ethical, metaphysical and epistemological writings of the past philosophers to see how his brightest predecessors reasoned about the matter. Aspects of each branch of philosophy can be studied in isolation, but philosophical questions have a way of leading to other philosophical questions to the point that a full investigation of any particular problem is likely eventually to involve almost the whole of the philosophical enterprise. One view on education believes or subscribes to the view that philosophy of education comes under the umbrella of axiology. As a branch of philosophy, it utilizes philosophical methods for the solution of philosophical problems with a philosophical attitude to arrive at philosophical conclusion. In this comprehensive process, it includes facts concerning education and synthesizes them with values. The other school of thought believes that education as a discipline utilizes or needs to incorporate all modes of philosophical inquiry, metaphysical, axiological and epistemological. As individuals involved in the process of education right from the aims, purpose, functions and building theory, we need to look at any body of knowledge or generate new knowledge based on the three modes of philosophical inquiry. Let us now move on to discuss philosophical method. Philosophical method or philosophical methodology is the study of how to do philosophy. A common view among philosophers is that philosophy is distinguished by the ways that philosophers follow in addressing philosophical questions. There isn't just one method that philosophers use to answer philosophical questions. Some common features of the methods that philosophers follow include first one, a systematic process of being skeptical about the truth of one's beliefs called methodical doubt. Second one, provide an argument or several arguments supporting the solution. Third, present the solution and arguments for criticism by other philosophers and help them judge their own dialectic. Next, doubt and the sense of wonder. Plato said that philosophy begins in wonder, a view which is echoed by Aristotle in his metaphysics. It was their wonder astonishment that first led man to philosophize and still leads them. Philosophizing may begin with some simple doubts about accepted beliefs. The initial impulse to philosophize may arise from suspicion, for example, that we do not fully understand and have not fully justified even our most basic beliefs about the world. Formulate questions and problems. Another element of philosophical method is to formulate questions to be answered or problems to be solved. The working assumption is that the more clearly the question or problem is stated, the easier it is to identify critical issues. A relatively small number of major philosophers prefer not to be quick but to spend more time trying to get extremely clear on what the problem is all about. Enunciate a solution. 
another approach is to enunciate a theory or to offer a definition or analysis which constitutes an attempt to solve a philosophical problem. Sometimes a philosophical theory by itself can be stated quite briefly. All the supporting philosophical text is offered by way of hedging, explanation and argument. Not all proposed solutions to philosophical problems consist of definitions or generalizations. Sometimes what is called for is a certain sort of explanation not a causal explanation but an explanation for example of how two different views which seem to be contrary to one another can be held at the same time consistently. One can call this a philosophical explanation. Next justify the solution. An argument is a set of statements, one of which it is said or implied follows from the others. One might think of arguments as bundles of reasons followed by the claim they are reasons for. The reasons are the premises, the claim they support is the conclusion, together they can make an argument. Philosophical arguments and justifications are another important part of philosophical method. It is rare to find a philosopher, particularly in the western philosophical tradition, who lacks many arguments. Philosophers are, or at the least are expected to be very good at giving arguments. They constantly demand and offer arguments for different claims they make. This therefore indicates that philosophy is a quest for arguments. A good argument may ultimately cure the original doubts that motivated us to take up philosophy. If one is willing to be satisfied without any good supporting reasons, then a western philosophical approach may not be what one actually requires. Next, philosophical criticism. In philosophy, which concerns the most fundamental aspects of the universe, the experts all disagree. It follows that Another element of philosophical method common in the work of nearly all philosophers is philosophical criticism. It is this that makes much philosophizing a social endeavor. Philosophers offer definitions and explanations in solution to problems. They argue for those solutions and then other philosophers provide counter arguments expecting to eventually come up with better solutions. This exchange and resulting revision of views is called dialectic. Dialectic is simply philosophical conversation among people who do not always agree with each other about everything. Motivation Method in philosophy is in some sense rooted in motivation. Only by understanding why people take up philosophy can one properly understand what philosophy is. People often find themselves believing things that they do not understand. For example, about God, the natural world, human society, morality and human productions. Often, people fail to understand what it is they believe and fail to understand the reasons they believe in what they do. Some people have questions about the meaning of their beliefs and questions about the justification of their beliefs. A lack of these things show a lack of understanding and some dislike not having this understanding. These questions about are only the tip of the philosophical iceberg. There are many other things about this universe about which people are also fundamentally ignorant. Philosophers are in the business of investigating all sorts of those areas of ignorance. 
methods of philosophy, identify philosophical methodology and the principle it employs in solving problems and resolving issues in human life. There are various philosophical methods that are used in education like descriptive method, prescriptive method, analytic method, critical method, phenomenological method or reflective method and speculative method. Let us now move on to discuss philosophy of education and teaching styles. Philosophy guides the process of education in different ways. A teacher approaching education philosophically needs to answer four basic questions. These four questions guide the teaching learning process. They are first one, what is the nature of the learner? Second, what is the nature of subject matter? Third, how should one use the subject matter to guide students towards meaningful learning activities? What behavioral trend should one exhibit in order to carry out one's philosophical position? The answers to these questions only will help the teacher to identify a series of preferences as opposed to a set of behavior that belong to mutually exclusive categories for the following questions. An attempt to answer these questions is nothing but philosophy of teaching. Philosophy and various philosophical viewpoints inform us that each of these questions have different philosophical perspectives that can be considered as extremes in a continuum. Nature of the learner. For the question about the nature of the learner, it will be defined in terms of extremes of the continuum by using the terms Lockean, which is passive and Platonic, which is active. Lockean is a position because it was John Locke in his essay concerning human understanding who first wrote about the human mind. The human mind according to him is a tabula rasa. He envisioned the operation of the mind as similar to a blank wax tablet on which data taken in through the senses would make impressions. Sensory data which a learner absorbed formed the true source of knowledge. Any complex mental operations involving association, interpretation or evaluation of secondary data led to the formulation of increasingly complex knowledge. Platonic image is that of a teacher who has so much respect for what the learner can contribute to the learning environment that he or she definitely does not want them to absorb prescribed subject matter as the teacher sees the subject matter. Under such circumstances, learners are viewed as the most important ingredient of the classroom environment because they teach each other and their teacher about problems which are meaningful to them. It is almost that learners have the knowledge which is locked inside them, which is released through interaction. Platonic concept believes in the doctrine of reminiscence. Next, nature of subject matter. The terms amorphous or structured are used to delineate extremes on the continuum of teacher's view on the nature of subject matter. The term amorphous label has been reserved for root learning which emphasizes that each item to be learned is equal in importance to every other item to be learned. Hence, youngsters are not encouraged to find relationships among items to be learned and no item is seen to be more important than the other. The other extreme, structured we may expect to find a position represented by those who have a quite realistic view of what the subject matter can never accomplish. The term structured as used in this context 
is from Jerome S. Berners' understanding that any subject matter should be viewed as having a natural structure which can help to explain relationships among its components and which can be used to find new information. How should subject matter guide students' learning activities? The two end points of the continuum is cognitive and affective. These concepts are not mutually exclusive categories but rather matters of emphasis and preferences. Evidence abounds that students bring into the classroom attitudes which influence the way they perceive facts, concepts and generalizations. Sometimes teachers are fortunate to have students who bring with them positive attitudes towards the subject matter at hand. Most often we have students who bring with them not very positive attitudes. In such situations the teacher's role will be to help students think critically by transforming generalization, beliefs and values into hypotheses that can be tested. The teacher resorts to the affective domain. Behavior trend in order to carry out one's philosophical position. The terms authoritarian and non-authoritarian are two extremes of the continuum but should be understood as not merely being stricter permissive. These words should go beyond the aspect of classroom management as it is more inclusive approach to classroom management. It is an overview of the student and the subject matter which this indicator has been designed to examine. For instance, suppose some teachers encourage students to view subject matter only as experts in that field might view it. Hence, these teachers habitually accept for each major question under examination only one right answer which all students are expected to adopt and understand. We can thus say that these teachers are said to encourage convergent thinking and hence in this context we can term them as authoritarian teachers. The converse can be said of non-authoritarian teachers. Teacher need to be aware of the philosophical positions that they take and have taken while they enter into classrooms or plan to enter into the classrooms. Philosophical positions affect the way they interact with the students and facilitate learning in learners individually or collectively. Thus, we see that the way we answer the questions of nature of learner, subject matter, etc. definitely affects our teaching style. Whether a teacher is authoritative or non-authoritative, whether teaching methods are constructivist or lecture method are influenced based on the philosophical position that they hold. Therefore, it is essential for the educators to have the deep insight into the philosophy of education. Let us now summarize what we have discussed so far. Philosophy, life and education are intimately linked with one another. They are also related to time and space. If we consider what, how and where to teach, we shall be discussing the subject matter, methods of education and human relations in schools. All these aspects of education are not fixed. They change according to the social and economic needs and concept of social sciences prevailing in the particular time. The needs of our present day society are not the same as those of ancient society. The scope of philosophy of education is concerned with the problems of education. The main problems of philosophy of education include aims and ideals of education, 
analysis of human nature, relationship of education and state, educational values, theory of knowledge and its relationship to education, economic system and the place of school in educational system, the curriculum and process of education and finally the relationship of education and social progress. Now you may try to answer the questions. First one, why is an understanding of educational philosophy essential for educators? Second one, why education is considered as the dynamic side of philosophy? Third, education and philosophy are like two sides of the same coin, elucidate. Third, what is the meaning of epistemology? Five, why is the study of philosophy important to education? Six, describe the scope of philosophy of education. Now, you may go through the reference books for further reference. The references are Theory and Principles of Education by J.C. Agarwal, Vikas Publishing House, New Delhi. Indian Theory of Education by H. H. A. Bourai, B. R. Publishers, New Delhi. Philosophy of Education by S. S. Chandra and R. Sharma, Atlantic Publishers, New Delhi. Foundations of Education by S. P. Chaube and A. Chaube, Vikas Publishing House, New Delhi. An Introduction to the Philosophy of Education by D. J. O'Connor, Routledge Publication, London. Encyclopedia of Philosophy of Education by Paul Monroe, Cosmo Publications, New Delhi. Hope today's session was beneficial for you. We shall meet again with another topic. Thank you.